Hello. It is with uh, great pleasure and privilege that the NPTEL team announces a series of lectures on Ayurveda as an Indian system of medicine by one of its foremost exponents in the last few decades, Professor M. S. Valiathan, who is a Patna Vibhushan and National Research Professor, Manipal, Karnataka, India. Padma Vibhushan is the second highest civilian award that can be given to an Indian citizen by the country and Dr. Valiathan is among the illustrious sons of India. A cardiac surgeon of international repute, Professor Marthanda Verma Shankaran Valiathan has been researching in Ayurveda for the past two decades and has been a prominent researcher in that field. He is currently a second term national research professor of the government of India with location in Manipal University where he was also its first vice chancellor. He has received several honors in a career spanning three decades including the presidentship of the Indian National Science Academy. He is a fellow of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine in India and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians England and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons Canada. He is a recipient of honorary doctorates from several universities. Professor Valiathan was born in Kerala and obtained his first degree in medicine MBBS from the Medical College Trivandrum, Kerala. He was a surgical trainee in the University of Liverpool, England which led to FRCS and master's degree in surgery. Subsequently, he specialized in cardiac surgery at the Johns Hopkins and Georgetown University Hospitals in USA and became a fellow of the Canadian Royal College in cardiovascular and thoracic surgery. He served as professor of cardiac surgery and director at the Sri Chitratrunal Institute, Trivandrum for two decades when it became an institute of national importance. Following his term as Vice Chancellor at Manipal University, Dr. Valiathan took up a serious study of Ayurveda with the encouragement of the university. This received a boost by his appointment as a National Research Professor, which is a prestigious Government of India award to the researchers for lifelong contributions in their fields. Among Dr. Valiathan's many valuable research contributions in medicine, he is perhaps most well known for developing and successfully transferring for production a series of high-tech devices such as the tilting disc heart wall, oxygenator, blood bag, etc., which laid the foundation for a modern medical devices industry in India. More recently, he has conceptualized and organized several studies on a science initiative in Ayurveda among a network of major institutions across India. These studies in basic sciences take their cues from traditional medicine such as the genomic basis of dosha prakriti, effect of rasayanas on DNA chain break repair and microstructure of metallic basmas. Apart from regular surgical work, he trained over 20 cardiac surgeons, published over 100 scientific papers, three books and several chapters in books. Lastly, Dr. Baliathan has received many prestigious awards such as the Hunterian Professorship of the Royal College of Surgeons England, R.D. Birla Award, Om Prakash Basin Award, Jawaharlal Nehru Award, Danvantri Prize, Arya Bhatta Medal, J.C. Bose Medal, G.M. Modi Award, H.K. Ferodia Award, Dr. Samuel P. Asper Award of the Johns Hopkins University and the Chevalier in the Order of the Palms Academic of the French Government to cite a few. It is with great honor that the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning announces a series of lectures by him on Ayurveda as a system of medicine from very ancient times. These will be made available through the NPTEL website and also through the NPTEL YouTube channel. I request Professor Baliathan to deliver his lectures. Thank you. Uh, this uh, course on uh, India's Ayurvedic inheritance is an unusual course. Unusual in the sense the lecture is being given by a surgeon 
on Ayurveda. And secondly, it is being addressed to students of science and technology, not to Ayurvedic physicians. So both these are unusual about this course, but I am greatly privileged and delighted uh, to be giving this uh, course. You may well ask, why should a scientist or a student of science or student of technology know anything about Ayurveda? Uh, they can build bridges, they can build houses, build hospitals, build instruments, even practice medicine without knowing anything about Ayurveda. Now to answer this question, I have two illustrative examples. Now before I, I get on with this lecture, I would like to give you the contents of what I am going to say, just like a book when you read, you have the contents given. First of all, I would like to say something about the urge to heal, where Ayurveda begins, animals as healers, part of evolution, Indus Valley civilization, a side story, very important, interesting. Something about medicine in the Atharva Veda, to which Ayurveda traces its roots. Then something about the changes which came about during the practice of Ayurveda, how it differed from the Vedic practice. Then elements of continuity, how in spite of differences, a thread of continuity continues from Vedic to Atharva Vedic medicine. And how Ayurveda develops views of its own going beyond the Vedas. This is about what I will be covering in the course of these lectures. Now the first illustrative example I would like to give, here is an old faded letter from the 17th century. You may not be able to read it, I got it from the Royal College of Surgeons archives. This is a famous letter written by John Hunter to Edward Jenner. These were great figures in the 18th century. That was a time when uh, surgery was becoming a scientific discipline and John Hunter was known as the father of this process. And Jenner was a student. He passed from London, MBBS. Then he moved to Gloucestershire to set up practice. But he used to be in continuous touch with uh, Hunter, writing letters to him about the experiments he was doing, asking for advice and so on. There was a running, running correspondence. At one point, he was doing an experiment, a series of experiments on hedgehogs, trying to study the role of heart in circulation, regional circulation, circulation of the brain, circulation of the liver. How does heart adjust the circulation? This was the subject of his study, doing it in hedgehogs. At this letter, Jenner wrote to Hunter, this is his reply. Now this is not, you can read this, this collection of letters have been published and the most important line there which has become a historic quote, why think, why not try the experiment. That has become a classic quote everywhere you will uh, hear this and the reason is instead of asking questions and asking me to answer them, why do not you do the experiment and find the answers. This was John Hunter's reply. Now this impressed Jenner to such an extent, several years later he was encountering the problem of smallpox, great epidemics in England at that time. Thousands of people dying from one outbreak of smallpox, no treatment and he was helpless. And he used to hear from the milkmaids in Gloucestershire that if we got, we do not get smallpox because we get cowpox in our hand, milking the cows. Now this, he took it seriously, but the doctors there, they thought very lightly of this. They thought these stupid women who have no education, this is simply superstitious belief. They never attached any importance to it. So he remembered what John Hunter had written, this historic letter. Why think, why not try the experiment? Now that was the beginning, the cowpox material which he started inoculating and the rest is history as they say. Today if the world is rid of smallpox, one of the worst uh, scourges that we ever had, that is all because of this experiment. Now this knowledge would not have come to him if he had not paid attention to the culture in which he was living. The ignorant people who are part of it, part of that knowledge ecosystem 
if he had ignored it, he would have been impoverished. Whole science, medicine would have been impoverished. That is one very important reason why the cultural surroundings become so exceedingly important to the pursuit of science or technology. Another example, which I would like before I come to Charaka, this is a famous painting of Rorich. Another example is more recent. Dr. Abhay Bang is a very distinguished uh, physician who was trained in Johns Hopkins and his wife is a gynecologist. When they came back from the United States, unlike so many other medical couples, they decided to practice medicine in the, among the tribal people of India. And they chose the most backward district of Maharashtra, Gachiroli, to set up practice. And when they went there, they discovered the government had already built a very good primary health center, nice building, good equipment, but the tribals would never go there. It had practically, practically closed down and they wondered why the tribals were not going there. But they were determined to live there and they built a hut very much like the tribal huts and doing practice of medicine. Slowly they endeared themselves to the tribal people. They understood some of the tribal language and one day Abhay Bang asked these people, why is it you never go to this hospital? And they said, sir, we never go there because that place is white in color and the doctors, all the people there, they have these white coats. And in our culture, the whole design of the place, this white color, this signifies death. So we will never go there. Now here is another example. You are practicing medicine for the benefit of the community, all the technology, all the science. It is meant for them, but they don't want it. So here again, you find that our background, the culture in which we live, we practice, we have to be a part of that. Otherwise, essentially, you defeat that purpose. And the Ayurveda is an integral part of our cultural inheritance. It has been practiced uninterruptedly from Vedic times, especially dominant during Buddhist ages in India. Um, but it was systematized by Charaka, whose painting you see here. This was painted by Nikolai Rorich, a great Russian painter who made India his home. He loved the Himalayas and many of his paintings are about Himalayas. And this painting is in the Banaras Kalabhavan Museum. He donated all his paintings to Kalabhavan. And you can see this painting there, Charaka coming down the slopes of Himalayas looking for medicinal plants. That is this painting. Now this uh, uh, Charaka says in one passage, Ayurveda is ageless. That is one of the statements he makes. And the way he meant it, diseases which he was dealing with from the old descriptions many centuries prior to him and what he saw, they were essentially unchanged. The picture of tuberculosis, the picture of elephantiasis, it had not changed hundreds of years. And medicinal plants which were supposed to act in a particular way in old texts, transmitted through gurus, it acted the same way in his time. Similarly, philosophically, if a particular property resided in a principle called samavaya, a property is residing in a particular substance. If you take that property away, that substance ceases to be that substance. So that guna inherent, the principle of inherence, samavaya, that was a law, it was a principle, which was there hundreds of years before Charaka, that was still valid. So therefore, on that basis, Charaka said, Ayurveda, since it incorporates all these, Ayurveda is ageless. But in a different sense, also this is correct, because there is what is called the urge to heal. And this was noticed by Vedic sages also, I will show you a quotation later on. Now, when the dogs, pigs, other animals, when they are sick, you will find them going and selectively nibbling on certain plants. They don't normally eat them. And chimpanzees in Africa, there is an extensive literature on this, they often get parasitic infections in the gut and they again go and selectively nibble plants. And this was believed to be due to the cognitive abilities of chimpanzees. But that cannot be said about pigs and dogs 
and now there is more evidence people working in this area moths fruit flies they also have this so obviously it is something innate it is nothing to do with the cognitive abilities because moths they don't have any cognitive abilities as far as we know so therefore the tend the urge to heal it is there in animals not only that if you go further down you find the dna whether it is single strand whether it is double strand if you break them immediately they begin to heal there is a dna healing there are healing enzymes cell membrane if you disturb it reconstitutes so there are at the very basic level whether it is the molecular level cellular level organ level there is a tendency to heal and this is why a great surgeon in france 16th century ambrose pare his famous statement i dressed the wounds god healed them this is a famous quote just like hunterian quote so therefore uh, that urge to heal uh, this is as old as life so when charaka says ayurveda is uh, ageless it has also a meaning in this sense uh, because ayurveda the mission is healing now this is the quote from the vedas you see they had also observed this is a an invocation to the medicinal plants i call upon those healing creepers known by pigs mangoes snakes and gandharvas to protect us i call upon the healing herbs of the angaras known by kites divine herbs known by rakhats which are probably bees and the plants known by swans to protect us so they all knew the, the even the atharva veda this quote shows they had recognized these animals birds they want to heal themselves and they know where to find the help self medication now a little topic of interest not directly related to ayurveda long before that as all of you know there is an indus valley civilization of india now this indus valley sir r d r d banerjee in the early 20th century he started doing extensive archaeological work in the sindh area and he was fascinated by these burnt bricks of a constant dimension hundreds of thousands of them in vast constructions it took a while to realize what this all represented and that was the time sir john marshall came he made an extensive survey a study and the discovery of harappa mohenjodaro and the famous indus valley uh, civilization now when you look at this indus valley whatever has been excavated now we know it spread much into gujarat like dhola veera all in fact a much extensive area rajasthan now in all these the same patterns you find the same type of town planning roads and so on but along with that you find drains along the side of the road there is a horizontal drain and if it is a double story building there are vertical drains coming down joining and finally they are all taken to a stream or a river or somewhere at the edges of the city now you see these uh, drains and also there are latrines in the domestic units there are several of them i'll show some pictures now the important thing for us is it is well known in every civilization this is public health engineering now this public health engineering comes long after a particular community has suffered epidemics diseases lots of people dying before they realize clean water is important here has something to do with it so public health engineering comes after a great deal of suffering through all this now here in this indus valley we have these advanced public health engineering the drains latrines they had some understanding of this but we have no idea whatsoever about the medical practices in this indus valley now these are some of the pictures you can see the drains opening on the right hand side you can see the drains opening different stories this is another one laid open there are covered drains here you can see the latrines several of them see that here again you see that uh, how the well it is constructed the how the horizontal drains going along the edges now the written tradition all these are unwritten and uh, we have the written tradition starts with the atharva veda 
and uh, Charaka explicitly says in his great uh, book that those who wish to study Ayurveda must be loyal to Atharva Veda. He specifically says that. And all the Vedas contain references to uh, diseases, how diseases are punishments awarded by gods, Agni, Varuna and so on. So these are in all Vedas they are mentioned, even something about treatment. But Atharva Veda is an unusual Veda in the sense some 30 percent it has 5000 verses and 1000 prose lines. Approximately 30 percent of this is devoted to the human body about diseases, about treatment of diseases and so on. This is something very unusual. And it is not correct that uh, Atharva Vedic hymns were composed long after Rig Veda. Uh, this is not correct because as you know even today Atharva Veda there is a lot of use of uh, talisman, of amulets. All these are very, very often mentioned in Atharva Veda. But today as you know the Rig Vedic rituals, hymns are not chanted very often and the Rig Vedic havans are hardly ever done. But the use of amulets and charms it is all over India even now. So there is something in the Indian mind which is fascinated, attracted to these amulets and charms. So Atharva Veda was simply reflecting a long standing uh, trait in the Indian mind. And it contains uh, the of course a large number of diseases are mentioned and the gods to be propitiated because if a particular god Varuna is angered and the punishment is diarrhea. And so when you make it some kind of a treatment you have got to propitiate Varuna and there will be a hymn addressed to Varuna. So there are a large number of hymns about diseases. But there is a, another very interesting hymn called the wonderful structure of man. It is a long hymn and there it describes all the organs of the body. Everything is mentioned but in a poetical fashion. Who made these eyes? Who made these cunning fingers of the man? Who gave the two arms and made him a hero like that? There is a little poetic touch but starting from head to foot all the organs, hip, the knee, the toes, all these are mentioned and goes beyond and says who put in the breath? inspiration and expiration in this man. Who created the sense of truth and untruth? Like that it is a long series of questions written in a very poetic style and the, tight, the entire hymn is called the wonderful structure of man. That is a part of Atharva Veda. So the Vedic approach to treatment, there are three elements. One of course is the uh, rituals, the amulets being tied and medicinal plants would be used but their function was supposed to be divine. In other words a medicinal plant tried as an amulet would be as effective if not more effective than being taken orally. That was the, it was essentially a faith based system of medicine, Daiva Vyapasraya in Charaka's words. Now the Vedic periodization I must say a word about it. I have mentioned 1500 BC as the time of the Atharva Veda. This is a periodization which is universally accepted western countries also. But recently in the last 20-25 uh, years there is an extensive uh, literature produced by scientists, geological survey of India there is even a book on that subject which they have produced based on papers by scientists. Now what they have found there is extensive evidence and Professor Waldia has written a book on this subject. There was a tectonic event in the Himalayas between 2400-1900 BC and when that and as you know Himalayas there is a lot of tectonic activity because the Gondwana land is pressing northwards and all sorts of geological events take place. It is an active area. So during one of these during this about 500 years due to that tectonic event the great river Saraswati which was flowing because Vedic hymns including Atharva Veda they always talk about a gigantic marvelous river. Uh, the river was Saraswati, the hymns to Saraswati, Rig Veda also has that. So these were saints living on the banks of the Saraswati, there was a civilization there. Maybe it is Indus Saraswati civilization that is a new term which many are using. But these were composed there. Now that Saraswati river with this tectonic event there was no flow into the Saraswati channel and this entire water was stolen by the Toynes Yamuna system. 
southeast direction it started flowing maybe some towards satluj towards the west saraswati overnight became dry and the population had to migrate and that is how you see the paleo channels and so on this is a view which uh, many in india believe and this a uh, lot of evidence is collecting it is not final but i thought i should mention that here if that is indeed proven then this our dating the atharva veda etc will have to go back maybe by a thousand years now the importance of mantras in therapeutics professor morris bloomfield who was a professor in johns hopkins more than 100 years ago he was a student of atharva veda and he wrote a book called the hymns of the atharva veda a very important book now there in his collection he has chosen what he thought was interesting and there i counted there are 65 aimed at curing diseases there are 10 for promoting good health 25 against sorcery 33 for inspiring love between couples and 9 on cosmogony that gives you an idea the kind of importance that diseases and their management received in the atharva veda and medicinal plants claim to act most effectively as talisman this is the point i made earlier at the mechanism of action was supernatural not pharmacologic and the practice of medicine was faith based now here i thought i would illustrate this because if you read one of these hymns of uh, atharva veda that hymn if you read it doesn't really make much sense what actually how did they treat and to understand what was the ritual accompanying that particular mantra you have to read what is called kaushika sutra which was a part of atharva veda it was an annexure so here i have taken specifically the example of jaundice a very common disease even today and if a patient with jaundice had approached a bishak bishak was the name in atharva veda for physicians so if a bishak was approached by a patient with jaundice how would he treat now here is from kaushika sutra we understand if that patient lying on the cot if he was brought to the bishak first of all he would be given a, an amulet tied around him with some invocations no invocation is mentioned but an amulet would be tried and then you see a, a a cow there a red colored cow and that cow would be washed a little bit of that water a sip of that would be given to this patient and following this he would be made to sit on a piece of bull skin fixed with a peg this is dipped in milk and it is anointed with ghee that is where he would be made to sit and he would be given milk and a porridge made of turmeric he would be made to drink that and he would be completely anointed all the way from head to foot with this porridge following that this would be washed off and he would be given a fermented drink we don't know it was whether it was uh, intoxicating but a fermented drink would be given and then he would be made to sit on this uh, cot or couch there he sits and he is made to chant a particular hymn which i will show you in the next slide now there he sits and the bishak recites this mantra and the patient repeats after him now that mantra when you read you get an idea about birds you get ideas about a cow we don't know how they all fit in what actually that he is doing at this cot if you see at the head side of the cot there is a yellow birds there are three yellow birds in that cage that cage is placed at the head side of the cot and at the foot of the bed you will see that red cow that is also an integral part of this now the hymn when you this is the hymn which the bishak chants followed by the chanting by the patient here is what it says up to the sun shall go thy heartache and thy jaundice in the color of the red bull we envelop thee we envelop thee in red tints unto long life may this person go unscathed and free of yellow color 
the cows whose divinity is Rohini and the cow is red, remember, they who moreover are themselves red in their every form and every strength do we envelop thee. Into the parrots, these are the birds, into the Ropanakas, probably thrush, do we put thy jaundice. And furthermore, into the Haridravas do we put thy jaundice. Because it was believed in those days, including in Greek medicine, that diseases or suffering could be transferred from one living being to another. This was a widely held belief. So here, this whole ritual is symbolic. What along with this various things which had been done, this yellow color of this patient is being transferred to the yellow birds where it naturally belongs. And the red color, remember this was written in the northwest of India. So people have almost a reddish color. Now that cow's red color is being transferred to this patient, which is their natural color, it is being transferred. Now this is, when you read this, the Kausika Sutra, then only this chant will make sense. If you don't read that, simply read this, it doesn't make much sense, it is confused. So this is the kind of practice which existed at that time. Now contrast this with the practice of uh, treating jaundice in Charaka's time. In Charaka Samhita, which was first century AD, you will find it was called Kamala jaundice. It was well known, well characterized, well described and is regarded as a manifestation of uh, disturbed pitta in gut and blood. That was the explanation. And early stages, terminal stage, liver failure, they are all described, natural course of the disease. And it is attributed to eating inappropriate or harmful food items, incompatible items, etc. And a variety of jaundice with clay colored stools, which we know is obstructive jaundice, that is described. And a treatment is by dietary regime, what is called pathya, panchakarma, various types, which we will be dealing with it later on, and a variety of medicinal formulations. It is essentially, there is no role for uh, rituals, there is no role for mantras. So this is medicine as we know today. So there is a very big difference. The Charaka who said you should be worshipful of Atharva Veda, in treatment, he has completely deviated from that. This is a major break in the practice of medicine between Atharva Veda and Ayurveda. And this is by no means unique because all disease treatment follows this pattern. Now the transition from Vedic medicine to Ayurvedic medicine, it was a slow process over hundreds of years. And transition was characterized in Charaka's own words from Daiva Vyapasraya, faith-based to reason-based, Yukti Vyapasraya. This is a Charaka's own uh, phrase. And it completely changed the uh, practice of uh, medicine. But does it mean there was a complete break in the whole of uh, Ayurveda? That is not correct. Only in the treatment part, because there are golden threads of continuity between Vedic medicine and Atharva Vedic medicine, that we can detect them. I think there are, these are the, what I have found very distinct threads of continuity. One is the structure of the human body, the understanding in Vedic times, listing of organs, listing of bones and all that, which are largely, you can detect them in Ayurveda. Second, functions to sustain the body. I have taken the example of uh, breath, breathing, air. That is again, you will find a continuity. Thirdly, medicinal plants. And next, attitude to life, attitude to nature. In all these, you will find there is a thread of continuity between Vedic medicine and medicine in Ayurveda. Now, structure of the human body, Professor Filioza, one of the great uh, Indologists of France, in his classic study, he has found a number of anatomical terms used in the Vedas, and he found 333 terms. These are not described as uh, anatomy or a science or anything, but these are terms which ordinary usage, these are all terms, we only a small examples I have taken, 333 I cannot indicate here. But you can see all these words which you see on the left hand side, antra, 
Asrin, Chakshu, these are all terms, Dhamani, they are every day being used even today. These were all used in Vedas, indicating different organs, different parts of the body and so on. So they are continuing to be used. Charaka listed 360 bones, total number of bones in the body and the Vedic total is exactly the same, but Sushrutha differed. He said, I do not agree with this Vedic, there are only 300 bones. You see that very explicit statement. So again you will find that continuity, the osteology, the total number is taken from Vedas by Charaka. But these anatomical terms in the Vedas, they are purely incidental, they are not textbooks of anatomy or medicine, these are incidental references when they do sacrifices for example or they had observed during war time they must have seen injured people. So these are observations made in different contexts and that is how they all find a place, not as a discussion of anatomy. But some of the terms they have changed their meaning from Vedic times too. For example, I have given two examples here, Nadi, Nadi is a commonly used term in Ayurveda, but in Vedas it was a conduit only for air. But in Ayurveda, it is a conduit not only for air, but all fluid substances. Blood also can go through that. So there is a difference in the significance, the meaning. Similarly, Ayurveda uses the word sira. Again, it is a conduit, but in the Veda, it is hira. So you will find uh, many terms, they have come, but slightly changed. The meaning also has slightly changed. Again, it is uh, showing a thread of uh, continuity. Now then we look at the functions, this is a more difficult area to detect a continuity. I took this wind as the agent of function in nature and body. And here why nature and the body? Because from Veda as well as Ayurveda, there is a continuous attempt to show the human being as a part of an integral part of the universe. That is macrocosm is the universe and microcosm is the human being, is the human body. Now this is a, a theme which is dominant, you find it in the Vedas, you find it in, in the Vedas and in uh, Ayurveda. So here nature, Rigveda for example, the, the wind that is the breath of gods, that is how it is seen and the wind in the body, prana, that motive power, that is what moves everything. The wind is what moves everything in the universe, the life breath of or the breath of gods and the life breath in the human body is what keeps everything moving here. And on death, the human being would dissolve itself into nature and the wind would be referred back, the prana would be referred back to the wind, the universe. So that is a, a theme which is reflected in one of the Rig Vedic hymns. Now several Vedic hymns celebrate the primal position of wind in the cosmos and the interrelationship with breath of the human being, prana. So there is a constant attempt to identify the prana within the body with the wind in the universe or in the world. So this you will find texts of Charaka and Susrata also when it comes to Ayurveda. You will find the mention specifically, I have given the quote here, identification of the wind as the soul of the universe and the body. So that is a, a thread of continuity through this and if you look at it from the body point of view, Rig Veda again envisage prana as distributed in the body as compartments. That was a particular like for example the food that we eat, it has to go down to the stomach throughout the gut. That movement is made possible by one division of prana. In other words, wind has different compartments. Now these you will find in the Vedic hymns also, prana, apana, prana is, this is the localization of the wind in the body, prana. Apana, vyana, samana, udhana, there are five different compartments of body, prana in the body. This was central to the functions in Ayurveda. Apana is for example evacuation, that is all dealing with apana, it is a different type of wind. Prana is the upper part of the body. So this kind of localization of wind in the body, that is a concept which is dominant in Ayurveda. 
Charaka Samhita, for example, had a major discussion on prana. Again, you will find these five divisions of prana responsible for different functions. So that it is not symbolic. Filiosa actually points out that these are actually Ayurvedic apana disturbance means somebody will have colonic disturbances, he may be constipated, all kinds of problems related to the lower gut. That is apana wind problems. So this division of wind in the body, prana, and disturbances in the in nature. This is Charaka has a long description. Wind is what moves everything in the universe what we call gravity, all kinds of forces. It was identified with Vayu in the universe. If that is not there, suppose it stops. And there is a famous uh, story in our epics, once the wind god was angered because Hanuman, Maruti was the son of wind god. And Indra hit him, his jaw was damaged and Vayu became so angry at this injury to his son, he decided not to do anything. He went on strike. And then it describes about the total paralysis. There was no movement in the universe. Everything would come to a stop. And everybody entreating this Vayu, please be generous to us. Please be active. There is a story like this. Now the opposite, if the wind is angered, then you will have cyclone, wholesale destruction. That is what would happen. So therefore, in the body, Charaka says, similarly, if the wind is peaceful, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, they are all in harmony, then everything is fine, there is perfect health. But if on the other hand, Vata is perturbed, if it is out of balance, then there can be very severe illness. So there is a constant attempt to find the state of the wind in the universe and the state of prana within the body. So this is again one functional aspect where you find a continuity. And then we come to medicinal plants, as I mentioned. A large number of medicinal plants are mentioned in uh, Vedic times. Example, I have given a few examples here. There is a whole lot of them here. Arjuna, Apamarga, Mashaparni. All these are being used even today. Pipali, Bilva, very commonly used in Ayurvedic medications. The holy, uh, the Atharva Vedic formulary has been adopted in Ayurveda. But then, in the Vedic times, these were associated with divinity and they were supposed to act through supernatural forces, often tied as a talisman and uh, almost all of them, I do not think that any medicine, any plant mentioned in Natharvaveda has been left out in Ayurveda, almost totally adopted. But the difference is this, in Vedic practice, whereas the mechanism of action, it was based on supernatural forces. Whereas in Ayurveda, when it came to that 1500 years later, they were supposed to act through their own pharmacologic uh, mechanisms. And this was rasa, is chemistry, we will be dealing with that later. Rasa is a short hand for chemistry in those days. Rasa Shastra came from that. Now the rasa of that particular medicinal plant, potency or virya, and once it gets digested, it requires a different post digestive taste because its chemistry has changed. And then some factors which are not known, Prabhava. So these are the mechanisms which make these plants effective. In other words, the Ayurvedic pharmacology, the mechanism of action essentially was pharmacologic. It was not supernatural. So there is a fundamental difference between the way medicinal plants were conceived to work in Vedic times and how it was conceptualized as working in Ayurveda. Now then we come to the Vedic attitude to life. It is a very important uh, area. Vedic people are essentially a happy, cheerful people. There are a number of, any number of hymns, Jivyama Sarabhasara, may we live for a hundred years. They want to live a long life, happy life, healthy life. And the famous uh, verse, famous uh, Mantra is this God's Padram Karnepi Shruyama Deva, that famous uh, mantra here. May we, with our ears, listen to what is good. And may we, with our eyes, see what is good. And may we, with firm limbs and bodies, 
offering hymns of praise to you. Stirai Rangai Tuttava Sastanu He. Enjoy the divinely ordered term of life. So that was a prayer. They wanted to live long. They wanted to live healthy, happy. This was a cheerful attitude. And Atharva Vedic hymns specifically asking for the growth of hair in a balding man, asking for cure for importance. You will find prayers for these in Atharva Veda. Essentially asking for physical well-being, happiness. The attitude was life. So the otherworldly, world renouncing attitude, it is singularly absent in the Vedic hymns. And there is no denigration of the human body, which you see in Vedic texts, you see in Vedantic texts, you, you will not see that in these Vedic hymns. And when it comes to Ayurveda, uh, look at this. Charaka says there are three basic urges for a human being. One is the desire for long life, pranayushana. Long life, a healthy, happy life. That is the first urge according to Charaka. The second, desire for wealth. And he says there is nothing more miserable than a long life in poverty. So it is important that you have some wealth for which you should be a farmer. You should go and work for the king. You should have some income. Specifically, Charaka says that. And thirdly, he goes on to that is Vitaishana. And the last is Paralogaishana. That is the life after death. There he immediately adds, there is some doubt about this. And then through a long series of arguments, he finally tries to uh, convince the reader that there is indeed a life after death. But he is not totally convinced. But the first two, he is totally convinced. So the Ayurvedic view is in conformity with the Vedic attitude to life. And again, that Indian stereotype, I think it is totally refuted. This point will come again as we go on with these lectures on Ayurveda. And then we come to the view on nature. Now, Vedic attitude to earth, rivers, trees, plants, birds, natural phenomena such as dawn was always a reverential. There are mantras, one of the most beautiful mantras on Ushas, the dawn. They were not only mystified, they were reverential. In fact, Max Muller calls pantheism, seeing God in all these. So they were reverential to nature. And the grand Atharva Vedic hymn, Bhumi Sukta, there is a long Sukta in Atharva Veda, a hymn to earth. And it, one place it says, earth is mother, I am earth's son. That is in the Bhumi Sukta. It is a famous line from that. And there are many others. They are all a child's adoration for the mother. That is the attitude the Vedic seers had about nature. Ayurvedic attitude to nature. Again, you will find it is in conformity with the Vedic. This world is the most beloved of all. Do not die before old age. They must have been anguished by premature death, young people dying. This is in relation to that. So again, enjoy life. It's a great nature, great earth that we have inherited. Let us be happy. So this attitude, a spirit of love and reference, reverence, which pervades just like the Vedas throughout Ayurveda. Now the discussions, Charaka Samhita is not like any other uh, great classic. Many of them are actually discussions held outdoors, on the bank of a, a river, under trees, a small number of students, maybe six to ten, they sit around an acharya and they discuss themes. This is how, and they, you will find the description, the trees, the bird song, the clear water in the river. So it's a very wonderful uh, Himalayan uh, scenic stage where all these discussions were held. It reflects, in fact, Tagore Shantaniketan. This is what he was trying to do. In Vishwabharati, he wanted classes held like this, not within classrooms like this. So this was again a continuity from our past. So most of these again, a great love of nature, which is reflected in the Charaka Samhita. And Charaka also talks about building a house for treatment. When patients had to have treatment for a particular illness, and it required in-house facilities. You could not do it in the patient's house. There was no way the physician could accommodate him in his own house. So he recommends building a house for treatment, for procedures uh, which required elaborate measures like panchakarma, for example, or a special type of fermentation 
in all these when you need in house facilities a special house for treatment had to be built. Now the description if you read again you will find location of the house in a house of great scenic beauty there should be plenty of trees, plenty of streams, lakes with clear water, cattle, bird song all these he describes. Not only that, that house itself the room for the patient there should be flowers to decorate that room and that house should house not only the patient, the physician, an attendant, a storeroom and there should be balladeers to tell stories to the patient to make him divert his attention. There should be musicians to sing. So when you read all that you realize it is a, it is not really a hospital at all. It would not look like a hospital, it would not sound like a hospital, it would not smell like a hospital, it is a, a place for healing. Now that description when you read, it is only a person who really loves nature who would be able to conceptualize a place like this. Now then we come to nature, there is a Shweta Shwetra Upanishad, one of the old Upanishads. Nature, how did they define nature? Isn't it what, what exactly, how do you define that? And Shweta Shwetra in the, in the definition, here Sushruta many centuries later, he has given a clear definition of nature. There he says, innate disposition, providence, I will give brief descriptions of each of these, time, chance, destiny and evolution. These are what constitute what we call Prakriti. But Shweta Shwetara Upanishad which went long before Charaka, there it talks about time, it does not talk about providence, chance it talks about destiny it talks about, but it does not talk about evolution. So here you find Sushruta has extended that, he has added providence, he has added evolution, he is going beyond Vedic description. Now what do these mean? Innate disposition, Sobhava, in the case of human beings it is what we call Vata, Pitta, Kapha, Prakritis. Every human being is endowed, we will discuss this in detail later on. But every human being at the time of conception, he is endowed with a particular prakriti, which may be vata, it may be pitta or it may be kapha. These are essentially detected on the basis of a certain number of uh, physical traits, certain mental traits, certain behavioral traits. When they combine, an aggregate of this would make it vata, another aggregate would make it pitta and kapha. Now the importance of this in Ayurveda is because the tendency to get diseases, predisposition to diseases, the course of diseases, the response to treatment, all these are determined by the prakritis. So without determining the prakritis, there is no way you can treat a patient. But in terms of nature, what does prakriti mean? And prakriti here all that we see as the universe with this stupendous diversity, it all started from avyakta, it is an indeterminate, ill-defined kind of existence. That is prakriti in nature. From that it starts, we will talk, discuss this in detail later on, how that whole process of evolution from that indeterminate existence that is the prakriti and final stage of what we saw called the universe. So that is Prakriti in, uh, in uh, nature, in the universe and Prakriti in the human being. So that is what is Sushruta is talking about, innate disposition. Then is Provident, Providence is not Ishwara, Ishwara cannot be part of this nature. But what is meant here, which is not in the Shwara Shwara Upanishad, it is the, it is a very important thing, the healing process which I talked about. It is not something that we have invented or developed, it is something as old as life itself. If there is a damage, that damage tends to heal itself, not because of we do anything. We may facilitate it, but it happens on its own, whether it is at the cell level or DNA level or various levels of biological organization, 
that healing is an integral process. Now that is something which is a gift, rain and sunshine. Suppose we did not have them or too much of it. Now this is again a gift, it, both for the good and the bad. It, sunshine is on evil and good, everybody gets it. Now that is again a gift, it is a beneficence, instinctive affection between mother and children. Suppose all the mothers, they did not have the affection and the state had to look after all the children. What would be life like? So that comes, it is again a gift, nobody has made it. So therefore all these that we see, the acts of beneficence, appreciated or not, but they are there. Now this is Ishwara, it is a gift, which Susrata talks about. Kala, time, that is the constant background and determinant of all that we see, and especially for a physician, gestation, birth, growth, aging, death, stages of diseases, early stage, late stage, it makes a big difference to treatment, march of seasons, all that, everything is against the background of time, which Upanishad also agrees, Kala, it is very important. Then we come to chance, there is a long standing argument as you know about causal events, a causal Causal events is karma, something is done, something will follow. Somebody keeps on heavy smoker, he will get lung cancer. There is a cause result. There is something which we can see, number of examples are there. But there are number of things happening at the same time for which no cause can be found. If a man is walking along the street, a coconut falls on his head, he gets a severe head injury. There is no cause that can be found or a tiger attacks somebody, no cause can be found. So there is an acausal process. So in what we call the strange life of ours or nature, there are acausal events happening. There are also causal events happening. Both these are there. Only then life becomes complete. You cannot deny that everything has a cause. You cannot really find a cause for many things. It exists. So therefore, that yadrucha, the chance, that is also part of life. And then we have destiny. Is there something, is life predetermined? This is a question which Charaka discusses at great length, I will come to that later on. There, are, there is a school of thought in India from ancient times, everything is predetermined. It is no use struggling against a fate, Deva decides everything. That was one view, very prominent, even today it is a very prominent view. But India also had another point of view, especially pioneered by Yoga Vasishta most eloquently stated, yeah, maybe some of them are predetermined, but there is also a fact you have to take note of that human effort can overcome fate. Vagpata is a great proponent of that. So there is a, that particular view is called Paurusheya view, which was uh, advocated by Yoga Vasishta and Ayurveda tends to move in that direction, because if life is predetermined, we will discuss it much later when you deal with prognosis. Human effort can overcome many of these, so there is a need to assert and work. Why not defy fate? That is an attitude. So the question of destiny, deity, that is also part of nature. And lastly we have Parinama, evolution. Evolution is not there in the Upanishad. Parinama is only Sushruta who is introducing. Now here is what I mentioned, how this whole universe has evolved from that indeterminate stage, then consciousness comes in there and that is followed by individuation. Then you have the forerunners of Panchabhutas, the five elements like fire, ether, water, earth, etc. All those five elements, Bhutas, these are Panchabhutas. Tanmatras are the forerunners of this. We will discuss this in, with the figures etc. later on. But all these Panchabhutas, they have evolved from the Avyakta stage from the beginning. Next is the Bahat, consciousness comes in there. Next is followed by individuation from a collective mass, individuation comes. Next is the Tanmatras, which are the forerunners of the Panchabhutas. Then comes the five Indriyas of the human body by which we are aware of. After all the universe, we can only sense it with our five senses. What is suprasensory, we do not discuss with at all. In fact, in Ayurveda also says 
we only deal with what our senses can pick up. What is suprasensory is not a concern of Ayurveda. So what we are talking about is what is accessible to the five senses. And once the five senses come, Indriyas, then the Indriyarthas come. That is vision, smell, taste. Now those, all those which can be sensed by these, that is our universe. You may use an instrument to see something, astronomy, but it's also vision, extended vision. So this great variety of what we call universe, that is how Parinama takes place. And in the Indian, this is actually a Sankhya system, which Charaka actually contributed to this Sankhya doctrine. According to Professor Dasgupta, the original Sankhya, Mula Sankhya, was Charaka's contribution. It is not uh, Sankhya Kariga, Sishra Krishna. That is what Professor Dasgupta says. We will discuss this interesting question later. But the whole point is that Parinama, that is also part of what we call nature. So you can see that from the time of uh, Upanishads, not only the Ayurveda adopted a great deal of uh, what was in the Vedas, but also it added certain things to the old Vedic concepts. This is a specific example. Now here is a, a, a picture of uh, Susurata, just to give an idea of the kind of classes which were held. This is Susurata Samhita based on that. There was Susurata's teacher was uh, uh, Kashi Raja Divo Dasa, a king of uh, Kashi, believed to be an incarnation of Dhanvantari. He was the teacher of uh, Susurata. And Susurata Samhita begins a, a group of uh, disciples here. They all go to this teacher and tell him, sir, we would like to learn medicine. Then he says, yes, I am glad to accept you, but what would you like to learn in medicine? And they said, we would like to learn surgery. That is Shalya. Shalya is surgery in, in the eighth division of Ayurveda. The very first is Shalya. And he says, I am very glad you have chosen that. I will be happy to teach you. So that Kashi Raja Divodasa, he is standing there and telling them, accepting them as say, his students. And the students propose that, sir, we will all be asking questions. And if everybody starts asking questions, it would make it very hard for you. So we would like to nominate Sushruta. He is the best among us. He would ask questions on our behalf. So he is sitting in the center. That is the particular picture here. Now, Ayurveda was not averse to accepting knowledge from abroad. And there are a few examples I'd like to give. There are descriptions of Alexander when he came. He took away Ayurvedic physicians from here. Hippocratic medicines, Corpus Hippocratica talks about Indian medicinal plants like cinnamon, pepper, and so on. But we don't know much about the exchanges at that time. We have no evidence to say influencing either way. Some medicines being used uh, doesn't tell us very much. But what is definitely known in the Brihatrayi, Charaka Sushrata Vagpada, there is very little reference to the use of mercury or Rasa Shastra. But as you know, later that became a very important part of uh, Ayurvedic practice, Rasa Shastra, especially like Sri Shailam. It became a great university in Andhra Pradesh dealing with Rasa Shastra. Nagarjuna became a great alchemist. So that became a very important part of Ayurveda, but it is much later. And there is obviously some evidence to think that this was, the inspiration came from Arab medicine because they had been using these inorganic materials, metals, minerals for a very long time in the Middle East. And that was extended by the Indian uh, physicians and they were given a mystical interpretation to the use of uh, uh, rasa. I know that in Tamil Nadu, Siddha system had been using for a long time. We don't really know the interactions of these. But the fact is, there is no question that Arab medicine did play a big role in the introduction of mercury into Ayurveda, the way it has been. And P. C. Ray, who one of our Acharyas, modern chemistry, the father of chemistry in India, as you know, he had edited a number of these. He took a special interest in uh, Rasa Shastra in India. He has edited a number of books, including one called Rasarnava. So there is uh, certainly evidence of adopting this knowledge from outside. Another, Nadi, feeling the pulse. There is no mention of Nadi in Charaka, Sushruta or Vagpada. Nadi Pariksha is today accepted by Ayurvedic physicians. 
and there is some doubt whether it came from China or whether it came from Arab. Certainly it did not originate here. So therefore, if there was something useful to treating of sick people, Ayurveda was not averse to accepting this knowledge from outside. And this is in keeping with Charaka's own philosophy, where he says, Krishno Hiloko Buddhimata Macharya, for the wise, the whole world is a teacher. That is in keeping with this old dictum of uh, Charaka. Thank you.